All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Today I want to thank you for hanging on to the very last session of NDC London. I know that you know, it's a Friday, and it's time for happy hour, and we got PubCon coming up. So you could have just bailed and gone to the pub next door, but I hear it's a UKIP pub, and nobody wants to hang out with UKIP politicians, I don't think. So thank you instead for uh, coming here. Today I want to talk about Git, the Git version control system, of course, which I suspect you're all using. Is there anybody who's not using Git? Who's using something else? Oh my god, what are you using? All right. Only SVN, no Git at all? All right, well, uh, I want to make you thankful for using Subversion then. No, uh, just kidding. But I do want to talk about some of the weirder intricacies and idiosyncrasies of, uh, of Git. Before I do, I want to introduce myself really quickly. I've never spoken at NDC London. I've spoken at other NDC conferences, so I suspect you know, a lot of you don't know who I am. My name is Edward Thompson. I'm a program manager at Microsoft. I work on Azure DevOps. If you don't know what Azure DevOps is, it's a suite of products um, for the software development lifecycle. We've got Azure boards that help you plan your software project, Azure repos, which store Git or TFEC, sorry, no subversion, um, repositories to store your code, and then Azure pipelines to build that code and deploy it into production. And I focus primarily on the CI CD side, so Azure pipelines, and the Git side. And I've been doing version control for a really long time. I've been building dev tools for years and years and years. Um, I was building version control systems before Git was a thing. So uh, a lot of when I look at version control, it's through uh, that lens a little bit. I don't only do developer tools, though. I, I do have a life outside of work, and that is also subsumed by <laughs> developer tools. So if you're interested in dev tools, and I hope you are, um, because you're here on a Friday happy hour instead of drinking. Um, I've got a newsletter, Developer Tools Weekly, which is interesting stuff, I hope, and a podcast about Git. It's called All Things Git. So I end up talking a lot about Git, as you can kind of imagine. And one of the, the talks I often give is about Git internals, like how Git works at a low level, because if you've used Git, you might know that it's a little bit hard to use at a high level. Like, the command line is weird, right? Using Git is frustrating sometimes. And understanding how Git works helps alleviate a little bit of that frustration, because you can kind of understand what it is that you want to do from Git's standpoint, from the object model standpoint, and then you can figure out what command you need to run to actually make that happen. Whereas if you don't understand what's going on at all, then you might not know how to map that to a command and you may just be lost. And you may end up deleting your repo and recloning it, and that's no good, nobody wants to do that. So I often talk about Git internals. Uh, and if you've heard this talk about Git internals from me or from anybody else, you might think that Git is this really well-designed system. And in many ways it is, right? I'm not gonna give the whole Git internals talk, but I will mention that Git is a directed acyclic graph. And really, what it does is it has pointers, and everything's really nice and beautiful. Uh, you have this uh, lovely graph of commits, and you have branches pointing to them, and head is a branch that points uh, to the branch you're on. And this is really elegant from a you know, software development standpoint, from a design standpoint. It's really great. I really love it. And if you uh, look a little deeper, then uh, you can look at how the, the trees are made up, right? So you take a file, it's called a blob in Git parlance, and that file gets hashed, and it gets stuck into a tree, and that's the, the, the hierarchy of your repository. And that gets hashed, and that gets stuck into a commit, and that, that gets hashed, and it points to other commits. And so what this is is called a Merkle tree. And when it's put into the DAG like we just saw, that's called a Merkle DAG. And you don't necessarily need to know any of this. I'm just you know, talking because I'm not going to give this talk about how beautiful the Git internals are. Instead, I'm going to tell you how Git is scary this time. So uh, if you do want to know this stuff, it's great. Uh, there's a pointer at the end. I can point you to other talks. 
what I want to do is step up a level. And instead of talking about these beautiful internals and the theoretical way that Git is supposed to work, let's talk about the way it actually works on a day-to-day -day basis and where it causes problems. And I can't not think about Git and problems and not immediately think about line endings. How many of you use Windows? Yeah, quite a few. How many of you have uh, run into some weird problem on Git where all of a sudden it's telling you a file's change that you've never touched before? Yes, those are line endings. So, really quickly, let's take a file. Simple file, it's got two lines in it. Hello, comma, world. And I've got over here on the left, my right, your left, uh, I've opened up a file on Unix. I've opened up the VI editor and I've typed capital H E L L O comma. I've hit the enter key, capital W O R L D exclamation point, hit the enter key again, save the file. No problem, right? Really simple. Over here on the right hand side, I've done the same thing in Windows with Notepad. But, of course, I don't get the same file. I suspect many of you know this. I'm sorry to be very uh, elementary, but I just want to you know, start from the basics. These aren't the same file. Why aren't they the same file? Because Unix uses a different way to store the fact that I've got a new line than Windows does. On Unix, I get one character. It's called a new line. It's ASCII 10. On Windows, I've got two characters a carriage return, and a line feed, ASCII 13, followed by ASCII 10. So sometimes you'll see funny characters at the end of a file when you look at it on Unix when it was made on Windows because it's got that extra character, that extra carriage return. Where did this come from? Well, you can go way, way back and look at this lovely device that existed before we had these nice LCD screens. Before we had CRTs even, we had teletypes. And this is an actual teletype. This is the, from the Teletype Corporation of Skokie, Illinois, not too far from where I grew up. It's right outside of Chicago. The teletype, this is an ASR33. And way back in the day, if you had a CPM machine, you know, the precursor to DOS, if you had a CPM machine, uh, and you wanted to talk to a teletype, you had to tell it exactly what to do. You had to tell it exactly what characters to put on that piece of paper, right? It's like a typewriter, but with a serial port on it. And so if you wanted to print to the user from a computer program, hello world, you would send capital H, E, L, L, O, comma. And then if you wanted to send that new line, you had to instruct the teletype what to do. You had to say, hey, now that the print head's over here, having written hello, comma, you need to get back over there to the beginning of the next line. So I want you to return. I want the carriage to return, hence the name carriage return. And once it is over there, you need to advance the paper. You need to feed the paper. You need to do a line feed, hence carriage return, line feed. And to be completely honest, this thing is very stupid. You probably also had to say, hey, while you're doing that, don't print anything else. Because if you just said, hey, do that carriage return, start sending the, the print head that way, now also start typing world, it would, you know, start typing world as it's going backwards. So you'd kind of get world in the middle of everything. So incredibly stupid. So as a programmer, if you wanted to talk to this thing, you had to be very, very careful. You had to know exactly what it was doing. Because the teletype ASR33 is different than, you know, an IBM teletype is different than somebody else's. Now, Unix, on the other hand, looked at this problem and said, holy crap, there's a lot of teletypes and I don't want to have to worry about them. So they built a device driver. Yes, not like a video driver, but a device driver for teletypes. So instead of, as a Unix programmer, having to say, send the, the print head back that way, advance the paper this many rows, and you know, why don't you wait a minute so that I can let that actually happen, because you don't know how long to wait. How long does it take the print head to get back on an ASR33? It might be different than a fast IBM printer. So in Unix, you have a device driver for this. You send a new line character, 
to Unix. You print it to the screen, or you know, to the TTY. Unix intercepts that, knows, oh, I've got an ASR33 connected. I know how to advance the lines on that. So very early device drivers to take care of this for you. And that is why Unix uses a single character. Okay, let's face it, their device driver could have used two characters and saved us all a buttload of trouble. But, you know, let's pretend that this nice fiction. But despite that, despite the fact that Windows grew up out of CPM, from CPM to DOS to Windows, and still uses those two characters, and Unix did not, it uses that one. Before Git, when we were building version control systems, we didn't care about what new lines you used. Uh, Team Foundation version control takes the bytes that you give it and puts it in the database. Git, uh, sorry, CVS, subversion, take the bytes that you give it and put it into the database by and large. Git is really the first version control system that aggressively expects you to uh, be cognizant of line endings and will kind of give you the middle finger if you get it wrong. <laughs> if you don't know this guy, this is Linus Torvalds. Linus built the Linux kernel, and he built Git to handle the Linux kernel. And so, um, realistically, a lot of the people who were involved in Git in the early days were also building the Linux kernel. So, you take a bunch of Linux hackers, you tell them to build a version control system, and then somebody shows up and says, hey, um, things are weird on Windows. Well, that's how we got into this mess, right? So, uh, if you actually go and look at the Git source code, you'll see some C, but you'll also see things like shell scripts, and Perl, and a bunch of things that weren't really made to think about lines that didn't have a Unix-style line separator in them. So, fundamentally, uh, the way that the Git community solved that was not, you know, hey, let's, let's think about this problem, um, let's devise a good solution. It was, well, we're here to build the Linux kernel and let's make it work for everybody else. So, what Git ended up with was this setting called core.autocrlf. How many, how many people set core.autocrlf? How many people have set it correctly? <laughs> right, right. I'll, I'll put my hand down, because I'm not even sure at this point. Fundamentally, the idea behind core.autocrlf <laughs> is that Git wants Unix-style line endings. Git will get Unix-style line endings, no matter what you have on disk. So it will take your lovely Windows style line endings on your Windows computer and it will do its thing and in the repository you will actually get Unix style line endings that it can cope with because early versions of Git, again, shell scripts, Perl, C, um, and it would do things like, okay, well if you want to do a rebase and your, the files that you're rebasing don't have Unix style line endings, I don't know what to do. Everything's a conflict, right? Because I've got these weird carriage returns in the midst of them. And if you go and look on Stack Overflow, if you read the ProGit book, if you read any guidance, it will all tell you to set core.autocrlf because that's what <coughs> Git wants, that's what Git expects to be a good Unix program, right? And so what happens when you have core.autocrlf set is you have some file contents. And over here, they've got a carriage return and a new line. They're in Windows style format. Um, and what we think of, what we talk about, so when I give that git internals talk, what we always say is, you run git add, git takes your file contents, hashes it, puts it in the object database, super simple, and we move on. That's a lie. I'm sorry that I lied to you. If you've seen my talk before, I, I apologize. What actually happens is we check. Is core.ocrlf set? So on a Unix machine, it won't be set at all. Its default is false. If you are on a Windows machine and you've set core.autocrlf equals false, then that fiction I gave you is true, and life is simple. It goes right into the object database, no problem at all. If it is set to true, what happens is Git runs what's called the CRLF filter. So it takes your file on disk in Windows format, cleans it, note, note that little judgment that Git has inserted, it cleans your file, takes the clean version and puts that in the object database, 
Now, anybody who shares your repository who is on a Unix computer, they just get that file just in that Unix contents, just the way they like it. You, you have to deal with the filtered version, that's no problem. When you run git checkout, the same thing happens. We like to pretend that we just pull it right out of the object database, put it right on disk. Super simple, super straightforward. Look how easy a system Git is. In reality, auto CRLF is in the mix, and you, Windows users, you look at auto CRLF, and when it's true, we run the smudge filter. We take that nice, clean content, we smudge it, and we put it on disk in Windows format. And everything's happy, right? Absolutely. There's no problem. I don't understand what the problem is, except everybody who raised their hand and said, yeah, sometimes Git tells me I've made changes that I haven't. I don't know what on earth is going on. Let's take a look. So, here I have, there we go. Here I have a Git repository. Let me zoom in a bit. And you know what I'm going to do? I have uh, a nice thing prepared. Let me hide that. Let me just get some things out of the way. There we go. Great. So I'm going to uh, clone a repository from GitHub. Put it right here on disk. And what I'm going to do, I'm actually on a Mac. It turns out Macs can have the auto CRLF setting as well. Who knew? So uh, I'm going to emulate being on a Windows machine and setting core.autocrlf equals true when I clone this repository. There we go. Nice and fast, all I've got is just a couple of text files. Right? A hello world and then, you know, a couple others. Uh, if I run git status, of course nothing has changed, right? I haven't touched a thing. Why would git status tell me that, that anything had changed? Um, so here's the trick about that. Let's look at what is actually uh, on disk. And again, I've set core.autocrlf equals true. So if I actually look at the file content, so I'm going to use hex dump and actually look at what's going on in here. I'll move that up so everybody in the back can see. Uh, hello, comma, and then, oh, there's two characters there. 0D, 0A, 1310, CR, LF. Uh, so I've got Windows style line endings on disk. Great. And that's fine because Again, what we've done is we've run this filter, we've taken contents out of the repository that had Unix style line endings on them, put them on disk with Windows style line endings. So if I look into the repository, if I look at the actual contents that are stored in the object database, I'll see Unix style line endings, right? Sorry, wrong command. So I want a ls tree head. This will actually show me the actual contents of the repository. This is my files, this is the hash, right? 40 character hash. Uh, and so I can take one of those hashes and actually look right in the object database. Let's take a look at uh, this hello text, hello world.txt. Uh, see, so if I run cat file, I get the contents. If I run cat file and pipe that to hex dump, I can see exactly the bytes on disk. And again, I'll scroll it up a bit. And oh no, I've got CRLF. But that's not the contract that I made with Git. I've cloned this repository. I've set auto CRLF equals true. And somebody else has checked in CRLF line endings. Hmm. And I said that I violated a contract with Git because, in fact, I do have a contract with Git. So every time I run Git status, what I should have happen is that it looks at the contents on disk runs that CRLF filter, ends up with Unix style line endings, and compares it to what's in the repository to know if I've changed something or not. So in theory, when I run git status, actually it should tell me that everything has changed, but it's not. It's telling me that nothing has changed. Well, that's kind of weird. Uh, and it explains why only some of you raised your hands and some of you kind of half-heartedly, well, why does this happen sometimes where git is confused about the line endings uh, that I actually have going on in my application, what's going on is you have encountered the cache, aka the index, aka the staging area. We talk about this beautiful piece of art in Git as if it is um, 
what we say about the index is that it's the next commit to exist on disk. When you run git add, you put things into the staging area. You have staged your changes, right? Sometimes when you edit a file, it'll say changes, you know, not staged for commit. You run git add, now they're staged for commit. Now if you go edit that file again, now you've got staged changes and unstaged changes. So that's what's going on here, is the index contains the things that you will commit the next time you run git commit. But it's got a bunch of names. If you look it up in the documentation, it's the index, it's the staging area, and sometimes it's the cache. And we almost never talk about what it means for this data structure to be the cache. Well, let's take a look at what's actually going on here. I can inspect the cache running get ls files dash dash stage, and this shows me the staging part of the cache, i.e. what's about to be committed. So if I run git commit, it will commit these contents. And in fact, that's identical to what is already there, so it won't actually do anything at all. I can also run git ls files dash dash debug. And now it spits a ton of extra information, like C time and M time and dev and I know and UID and GID and blah, blah, blah. What on earth is going on here? This is stuff that doesn't get checked in. This, there is no git data structure when you run git clone that gives you this information. This is the, the caching part of the index. So when git checks files out on disk, when it writes files in your working directory, it updates this information. The C time is the creation time, M time is the modification time of the files that it has put on disk, not the time that it was changed in the repository, when you checked it out. The size of the file, the UID and GID. So it updates this whenever it writes a file so that it knows that it wrote the file. So it puts the file on disk, it says, hey, here's when I did it, now I never have to look at it again, because I know you haven't touched the file. It's only when you go start changing the file that you've invalidated the cache and it has to go and look at what you've done to find out if you changed something or not. So let's get rid of that cache. I can get rm-r dash dash cached star. So usually git rm will remove files from your repository. I don't want to remove the files. I just want to remove the cached information. I want to remove them from the index. Okay, now if I run git add dot, it'll put them right back on disk. And now if I run git status, everything is modified. Because I've invalidated the cache, now git looks at the files on disk and it says, hey, everything's different, right? Because it's pulling the data off disk, applying that CRLF filter, and comparing it to what's in the repository. CRLF filter turns it into Unix style line endings. What's in the repository has Windows style line endings. So these files are, in fact, different. If I run git diff dash dash cached, it'll tell me how, and the answer is they're not. Git is telling me that I've changed all these files with nothing at all. Because of course, it's just a bunch of line ending changes. Oh, it is terrible. And this can happen to absolutely anybody. This is the path that Git takes you down. Git, when you install it on Windows, Git for Windows, has this nice installer. And it takes you through it. Where do you want to install it? Next. You know, what it, things do you want to enable? Next. Do you want auto updates? Next. And you just keep clicking next. And one of those questions is, how do you want to set up core auto CRLF? And even if you're not in the habit of just install it already, clicking next, if you stop to read it, it's going to ask you, do you want to set it up? So that, you know, it, it's a page of text that doesn't make any sense, right? I get to this. I've written CRLF code. I've built translators. I've built these smudge and clean filters. And I get to this question, and I'm like, God, I don't even know. So how then should someone who's never used Git be expected to get this right? I'm sorry. The Git community has failed you all here. Mm -hmm. I have... There's, there's no easy way to put it, because even, so let, let's take a look at my repository. This is an actual production repository that I use. It's called libgit2. 
It is the Git implementation that GitHub uses and Microsoft uses in GitLab and Bitbucket. Git Kraken, all sorts of tools are built on top of this repository. We're supposed to get this right, right? So if I run git status, I've not changed a thing. Let me check out a, a commit, a branch from about two weeks ago when we screwed something up. And yeah, I really screwed something up. Now all of a sudden it works. Hmm. Uh, yeah, okay. Well, in theory, this was supposed to say that uh, you know, I had a file changed as soon as I switched branches, and yet I apparently do not. Let me make sure I did the right thing. Yeah. Okay, well, indeed, these sorts of problems are very wily, aren't they? Yeah, okay. Well, we'll just pretend that that actually had a phantom uh, failure, won't we? Uh, the demo gods are not nice. In any case, let's pop back to our original repository that has all of these changes in it. Right, so the, the solution to this problem is not actually core.autocrlf. Despite the fact that you've read it in uh, books, you've read it on Stack Overflow, you've read it uh, and surely heard it from uh, people like me, uh, core.autocrlf is not the solution. At least it's not the only solution to this uh, problem. Let's, uh, let's back these changes out real quick. And what we actually uh, want to do is set up what's called a git attributes file. Why is core.autocrlf the right solution and git attributes uh, or is the wrong solution and git attributes is the right one? Core.autocrlf is a setting that you set on your computer. It does not get checked into the repository, right? We set it here locally, but that didn't actually match the reality of the repository that we cloned. The repository that we cloned had Windows-style line endings, which I will posit is fine. But we had core.autocrlf set to tell Git that the repository we cloned had Unix-style line endings, and that is a problem. So what we need to actually do is check in the configuration with the contents, right? If we have Windows style line endings in the repository, that's fine, as long as we tell everybody cloning the repository that that's the case. Same with Unix style line endings. And so that's where this file called .git attributes comes in. With a git attributes file, you can check in the configuration of your line endings into the repository. And so what I would encourage you all to do in all of your repositories is set it up with star text equals auto. This is the moral equivalent of core.autocrlf equals true. This says put files in my repository as, with Unix line endings and on a Windows machine, check them out with Windows style line endings. So in other words, on every computer, give me my native line endings. I think that's a perfectly reasonable solution. Uh, there are other options here. You can say, hey, just never touch anything Git. Just put the contents right in the repository. Always give me what I check in. I think that's fine too. The important thing is it needs to be configured here. Okay, so let me save this file. And now when I run git status, it'll tell me everything changed, right? Indeed, it does not. It just tells me my git attributes file changed because again, the cache is kicking in here and it's telling us that it's put these files on disk, it knows that we haven't touched them, therefore nothing could have changed despite the fact that we've updated the line ending configuration. Well, in that case, there is a second step that is necessary. Let me get it up at the top for everybody in the back. Git add dash dash renormalize dot. And this is it. You update your git attributes file, you run this command, and, mm, okay, I'm not gonna lie. Many of your CRLF problems will go away when you do this. If I run git status after that, it will tell me all the things that have changed. It's updated all of those files, and if I run git diff, dash dash cached to show me what is staged, it's updated the line of things. But this is the last time that that will happen. So let me also get add my git attributes file and check that in. Great. 
And now, of course, I have to actually uh, push this change. So I will push it up to my GitHub account. And great, all of my problems are solved, right? <laughs> oh, if it were only so easy. Let me pop over to my GitHub account. And the problem is that I actually have some pull requests open. And the pull requests, of course, are open against the old contents of the repository. And now I have conflicts. I have conflicts because I've made a change, but I've also updated the end of every single line. So every pull request I have now has conflicts in it. And this, I admit, is really painful. Um, however, there is thankfully a really easy way to get yourself out of this. So, you know, you could of course do, uh, sometimes it's called flag day, where all of a sudden everything in the repository changes and everybody has to throw it away and clone and start over. That's certainly one option, and if you're a one-person team, that's a reasonable one. If you're any more than that, that gets old really quick. So let's say I'm one of these pull request authors. How do I get myself out of this situation? Well, let me check out one of these branches. Uh, and what are the changes that I'm bringing in? Well, again, let me bring that up top for, the, for everybody in the back. So what I've changed is I've changed the end of the line from a period to an exclamation point. And Git is actually so deficient about line endings that it is still showing me this, even though the line ending didn't change on this pull request. Thank you, Git. Um, again, that's why, um, that's why normalizing line endings really is helpful for Git. It's not great at this. It really did come out of Unix. But uh, what I can do is I can run git merge master. And this is going to conflict, right? We've, we've made all those changes on master. We've changed every line of every file. It will definitely conflict. So that is not enough. If I am the pull request author, what I actually need to do is give merge a special flag. So just like we ran add uh, dash dash renormalize, I can merge with renormalization. And so for any of my pull requests, all I have to do is grab that new master and git merge dash dash, sorry, dash x renormalize. I've got this all written down. You don't have to memorize any of this. I'll point you to it at the end. Um, so what does this do? Dash x passes a, a flag to the merge strategy telling Git, hey, instead of just doing the merge simply, fix up the line endings first, everything's changed there, voila. It just takes me right to the editor telling me that I've merged. And so what actually happened? It brought in the line ending fix ups as well as the, the change. So now I can just push that back to my pull request branch Pop back over in GitHub, hit reload. I don't even have to hit reload, it even knew. And now that pull request is green. So it is annoying, I concede. You might think that you don't want to go through this pain. However, I really think that you know, this is a rip the band aid off situation where you update the line endings once and for all. Yes, you'll have to touch the old pull requests, but it's a very straightforward process. And after that, you should not see any more of these sort of phantom, I call them phantom changes, where all of a sudden it tells you that you have made a change, but you in fact haven't. All right. Let's put line endings aside for just a minute. Uh, one of the things that, uh, I think is really interesting about merge is something that I see every time I do a merge. Almost every time I run it, it says merge made by the recursive strategy. I think a lot of you have probably seen this too. 
what does that even mean? It took me, I had to actually write merge code before I actually understood what that meant. And I think it's fascinating. So I want to share that with you really quickly. So. There we go. So uh, the idea behind merge is, is pretty straightforward. Um, the, when I talk about Git internals, uh, what I like to say is uh, that when you merge one branch into another, let's say we're merging the branch called branch, because I'm very unoriginal when it comes to names, into this branch called master, what happens? Well, we do what's called a three-way merge. And in, this is, this is true not just in Git, this is true in pretty much every version control system. The idea is that you uh, find the common ancestor. You find out where uh, the last time a merge took place between two branches or where they forked off originally. And in Git, it's really easy because we've got this nice graph that represents the way changes happened. We started out with a commit, we made another commit, and then we branched off of that. And we ended up with this branch called branch. Master kept going. So it's really easy to figure out where that common ancestor is. It's right there. Git makes this really stupid straightforward. Um, obviously, in a, uh, in a more complicated repository, this, this gets a little bit harder. But this is nothing like the difficulty in, say, Team Foundation version control or subversion, where you've got to track every branch and merge operation and do some math to figure out where you're at and, honestly, sometimes get it wrong. Uh, Git doesn't get this wrong very often. Um, but that identifies the way trees get merged, and then you take files and you do the same thing, right? So uh, you look at, let's say, a common ancestor. It has um, six files in it, A, B, C, D, E, and F. And what you want to do is basically look at each of these files in each of the branches that you're merging and figure out how things have changed, right? So this shows my changes. Let me give you some color so it's not quite so... Uh, terrible to try to read. Right, so in our common ancestor, a.txt, totally unchanged. What happens in the merge? Well, it doesn't matter. We take any of those. They're all the same. So we, we take the file. Uh, you know, often when you do a merge, most of your files don't change. That's, that's very true. But when you do change a file on just one side, and Git calls it the R's side, that's the branch that you're on when you run git merge, kind of a weird terminology, but whatever, it works. Um, so if you change the R's side from the common ancestor and you don't touch the other branch, well, we just take that, right? That's, you know, I've edited a file, I run git merge, now the file I changed gets into master, no problem. C.txt didn't change, D.txt only changed on one side, so we preserve that in the merge. We don't want to obliterate anybody else's changes, of course. The tricky bits, of course, come in when we've changed uh, a file on both sides, so we need to... We'll put a pin in that. Um, we need to figure out what to do when we've changed a file on both branches. Um, and you know, if it, even if it's a delete on only one side, that doesn't matter. That's not a conflict. If you've deleted it and changed it, that's a conflict. Um, so the tricky bit here is what happens when I've changed a file in both places? And what we really do is the same thing, only for the contents of a file. So for this file, I've got 10 lines. In my branch, I change line two and three. In their branch, they change line seven and eight. Well, just like before, I can just take those changes in and get all of the contents from both changes. Again, the tricky part comes when I actually change the same set of lines. And unlike when you've got working with files, Git doesn't go character by character and try to figure out you know, what you've changed in each line. That would be madness, I think, for the most part. Git just kind of gives up and says, well, if you've changed line five and six in one branch, line five and six in another branch, you've got a conflict, right? I'm sure you're used to seeing all of this. We saw it just a minute ago when we changed all the line endings. And what Git does is it dumps out a file with all these arrows in it. All the arrows for your side, and then below that, a bunch of equal signs, all the arrows for the theirs side, right? So we saw just a minute ago what happens when you do all of these changes and end up 
with just line ending changes uh, in the midst of uh, what you're doing. We kind of call that around uh, where I am, merge hell, right? And the way to get out of that uh, is through the renormalize flag, which we saw. Um, and again, that's a flag to the recursive strategy. There we go. Right. So what on earth does that even mean? Well, it's, it's a way to ideally make things a little bit better, right? So uh, what I want to do here is create some conflicts. Uh, actually, let me pop back to uh, this branch here. So hello.txt. Uh, I'm going to make this a question mark here. Run add and commit. And go back to master. Make a different change. Uh, let's bring in more exclamation points. And when I run git merge branch, of course, it tells me I have a conflict because I changed the same line in both, right? And it gives me, again, all of those arrows. Right. So one of the things that I can do here is get a little bit more information about what's going on. So let me abort this merge. I'm going to start over. But before I do, I want to set this uh, flag. It's called merge.conflict style. And so instead of drawing those arrows and the equal sign and the other arrows, giving you the side that one side changed, the side that the other side changed, this will give you a little more insight into how they changed by showing you that common ancestor. So it'll show you the contents that they were before anybody changed anything. And that can give you a little more insight into how you've made changes and how the other side has made changes. Because sometimes that's really obvious, sometimes it's not. So I can set it to what's called diff3, meaning bring in the all three sides of the merge. And if I run get merge branch again, still got a conflict, of course. But now I get more information. So I've got head and I've got my side, got the branch that I'm merging in, uh, and that's a question mark. And that tells me that it used to be a period. So I get a little bit more information. But it also says merged common ancestors. So it's not the common ancestors, it's actually the quote unquote or common ancestor, rather. It's the quote unquote merged common ancestors. And that is where the recursive bit of git merge recursive comes in. So let me throw that away. Done with that, don't care about that anymore. I've got this branch or this repository right here called recursive. And if I run git log and turn on the graph mode to git log, which I think is a great uh, bit of functionality, uh, if you've never done it. Sorry, let me actually do that and then show all branches. So this ASCII art is a bit on the deficient side, um, but you can kind of see that this graph is a little weird. So what I'm doing is uh, one of my branches goes off, another branch goes off, and they actually got merged back together. It's what's called a crisscross merge. And this is the point at which I throw this away and I start looking at a real tool. Uh, tower is a good one, and I can look at history in Tower. So let me open up that repository. Uh, let me look at my history, and I can zoom in a bit. This makes it a little bit easier to see what happened. Again, uh, I've got this branch here merging back into that one, and then this branch merges into that one. They merge into each other. So if somebody has checked out branch, run git run merge master. Somebody has checked out master, run git merge branch, and that's where we're at. So everybody has each other's changes. In a perfect world, that should be very uh, straightforward because they've resolved the merge conflicts that arose when they merged into each other. So now, if I'm in this branch and I, uh, let's actually do this. So Git gives you a command. Uh, again, we looked at it on the graph. We could say, hey, where did these uh, branches come from? What was their merge base or their common ancestor. Git gives you a command to do that. It's called git merge base, not surprisingly. And it will tell you the common ancestor. 
And you can run git merge. Let's use uh, the standard git merge. It's not the default, but it's the sort of bare bones. It's called recursive merge instead of resolve. I'm sorry, resolve merge instead of recursive. And it will tell us that we had a conflict. So everything failed, there was a conflict. It dumps all that information in there about uh, how things change. So let's abort that for a second. And let's, instead of running merge base, let's run merge base dash dash all. So again, because of that, because master merged into branch, branch merged into master at the same time, we got what's called a crisscross merge. So if we look back in our graph, these two branches now have two common ancestors. So if I run merge, get, if I run get merge base dash dash all, I get two. So the default situation here, what Git tries to do is do that recursive merge. So what it'll actually do is it'll take these two merge branches and merge them, and then use them as the common ancestor, hence the recursion. So it'll basically just keep going down, merging things into each other, and trying to give you something nice. And so before, when we ran the, the version of merge that just uses one merge base, we had a conflict. When we run with two, the, the default, uh, it works, and it works fine, because the merge was made by the recursive strategy. So, excellent. So recursive merge is great, and it'll totally save you all of the time, right? <laughs> no. Uh, sadly, no. And I, that's why I tell you that this exists, so that you know how to get out of it and what to expect when you uh, see it. So here I'm on a different branch, uh, sorry, a different repository. And if I run git merge branch, again, it uses the recursive strategy. Everything's fine. Absolutely no problem, right? Oh, no. We had conflicts. And holy shit, did we have conflicts. Look at this. Look at all these merge markers. So what's actually happened here, let me get rid of everything else, and we can just see just the conflict. This is one conflict, one line changed. Right? Down here we've got the branch, one line. Up here we've got head, one line. In here, this is what we get when we turned on diff three. That is our common ancestor because git diffed these things. You know, it's done the recursive merge. It tro goes and finds that we've got two common ancestors. It's gonna merge them together to use as the, as the merge base and they conflicted. So when they conflict, git will say, well, I don't care about that. I'm gonna use it as the merge base anyway. What could possibly go wrong? This is what goes wrong. Here's how it could go even more wrong. If you had made the same change somehow in your master branch and in your other branch, that's not a conflict, right? But you can start sneaking in bits of this because this actually get, uses this in the algorithm. This is, it, it doesn't say, hey, there's a conflict, so we're gonna propagate the conflict. No, it doesn't do that. It says, here's the merge base, go on. And usually when there's a conflict in the merge base, you get a conflict in the result, but not always. So you can get, you can go look on GitHub, you know, go search GitHub or, or Google. Uh, people who have checked in, you know, this line, temporary merge branch. You'll find it because it snuck in because Git didn't propagate that. So. A, be careful, check your, you know, do a build. Just because it merged, do a build, run your tests. Sometimes these things uh, sneak in. So analyze that carefully, pretty please. Do it for me. And, you know, all your coworkers. Uh, right. So that's merge in a nutshell. Merge is a great, great thing. I don't want to start any holy wars. Um, especially not in England when I have a picture of the American Revolution. Um, I don't want to start any holy wars, but anytime I talk about merge, you can't not talk about rebase. And since I told you how to renormalize and touch every single file in your Git repository to fix its line endings, and then how to merge things to fix them, I would be remiss not to tell you the same thing about how to do it with rebase. Real quickly, how does rebase work? Rebase works very, actually, similarly to merge. Again, if you have some branch master and some branch branch and you want to rebase branch onto master, if you're on the branch 
called branch and you run git rebase master, what happens? Well, once again, git finds that common ancestor. It's there. And then git takes all of the commits that you've made since that common ancestor and it plucks them off and puts them on top of that branch, i.e., this branch is your new base, hence the name rebase. Here's the tricky bit about rebase that you might need to be aware of. Well, there's two kinds of rebase, and one of them is not interactive. That sounds weird because a lot of people run interactive rebase. No, there's two kinds of rebase. There's patch application rebase, where in order to figure out and get these commits over here, it builds patch files for each of them, as if you ran git diff on each. You ran git diff to isolate the changes here, you ran git diff to isolate the changes here, puts them away in a directory, switches over to this branch, and starts applying them one by one. That's one way git rebase works. The other way is by cherry picking instead. It's a subtle distinction, I admit, but one of them involves patch files and running git apply, the other one is git cherry pick, which uses the merge engine. So behind the scenes, it actually runs the merge code to do that. And running the merge code is good because uh, what happens is that you can take advantage of all the things like, um, like the, the, the renormalization bits that we saw earlier when you are actually doing the rebase. So let's take a look at that real quickly. There we go. Right, so uh, let, me, let me clone down that repository again. Great. And let me uh, switch to my branch called branch two, which I. Thank you. Apologies. Um, let me figure that one out. Let's do that. Hey, all right. Great. Uh, so now I'm on a. Let me check out branch two. So this is a different branch that had a pull request open when I did all that renormalization stuff. Uh, and I want to run git rebase master. And of course I get conflicts because again, all of my lines changed in the master branch, uh, so I need to update them. The interesting thing about this is you'll see um, that it started to do this rebase and it's, it's totally failed. And if we actually look at what's going on in the .git repository, we've got this directory called rebase apply, which will give you a hint that it's using the apply mechanism. And if I actually look at what's going on, this is literally a patch file, right? It, it was produced by running git diff, uh, and that's what rebase is doing. It's applying these one by one by one, and it doesn't know how to cope with the fact that you've changed all those line endings. So let's throw this away. Let's get rebase dash dash abort, because we can instead use rebase dash dash merge, which uses the lovely merge engine, which does understand how to, to handle line ending changes. Um, so we'll, we'll do that, and oh, that failed too. So what we actually need to do is give it uh, a little instruction. So let's abort one more time, and what we can do is git rebase dash x. Just like we did with merge, it takes the dash x flag, which passes um, options to the recursive merge strategy. So I can git rebase dash x, renormalize, master, and now it's gonna cherry pick, which uses, again, the merge strategy, and it's gonna pass the renormalize flag. So just like before, it's going to forget about the line ending changes, it's gonna apply our changes directly, and our rebase is all done. So if I run git log, uh, now I should have a nice linear history going all the way back down, and indeed I do. The red's kinda hard to see, but it's a nice straight line like the rebase advocates in the room like. And again, I'm not gonna get into a, a religious discussion about which of those is better, just that you can indeed take care of your line endings with both merge and with rebase. <coughs> great, great. Uh, real quick, 
So why is rebase with apply the default? I could not come up with anything. Uh, I'm, I, was, I was convinced that there had to be a reason. I stayed up until like four this morning, like banging on this, like surely there's something. Uh, patch application can do binary diffs. That's kind of cool. So in theory, you could do a rebase with binaries in your repository and it takes up a little bit less disk space when you do. That was the best I could come up with, but even that's not true. Uh, I finally uh, ended up asking a couple other people and the answer is there isn't a good reason. They're actually moving towards um, making merge the default in rebase. So one of these days, you won't necessarily have to do all these uh, shenanigans to make rebase uh, a little bit more line ending aware. Right, um, so that is really all the time that we have. If you started seeing uh, graphs and um, Merkle trees and said, I don't know what's going on, but I'd like to, uh, be sure to check out uh, insidegit.com where I have videos of actually diving into the Git repository and, and ripping that open and showing you how that all works. Uh, I will also put links to everything that I talked about with line ending renormalization. So if you have line ending problems, I will have links to what I just talked about um, on this site um, on my train ride home tonight. So. Uh, Anyway, I want to thank you all very much. I really appreciate you guys hanging out until, uh, I want to appreciate you folks, sorry, hanging out um, until, you know, right bumping up to PubConf. If you don't have uh, tickets for PubConf, see if there are still some available. Be sure to check that out. Um, and yeah, thanks for coming to NDC London. And I will hang out if you have questions.